It's red and yelling at me. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for surviving to day two of Florida Drupal Camp or day three and the after party. I know Sundays are always fun. Um, today we'll be looking more at Solar and Drupal, specifically kind of how to find exactly what you're looking for within Drupal. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Chris. I'm an engineering manager at MindGrub. We're a large agency out of Baltimore. Um, despite manager being my title, I still spend the majority of my day as a lead engineer and architect working with our production teams. Don't do that much people managing or um, still very much involved in the, in the weeds within our Drupal teams. Um, Asterisk, like every company I think on the face of the earth that has a Drupal team, we're hiring. If that interests you, talk to me after the talk. That out of the way, um, kind of jump right into it. Uh, you know, one of the things that's unique about MindGrub is we're not really a Drupal agency, and I, that was appealing to me, especially going through the transition of Drupal 7 to 8, of like the get off the island, started becoming a lot more interested in what Symfony was doing, what Laravel was doing, Cake, WordPress, other um, solutions, and I think what it's uh, built for me is a greater appreciation for things that Drupal does really well. Um, in the past, honestly, it did so many things for me, and I was familiar with it. It was kind of, everything was a blue nail to the Drupal hammer. Everything I encountered was a solution meant for Drupal. A um, little bit more experience looking at that. I think some things Drupal does really well is obviously content management um, kind of goes into the title. Specifically, I think building well-structured and designed data schemas to support content management. I think what's unique with Drupal is it's, it's not the only framework even PHP that does that does a really good job of exposing that to the user to allow them to kind of build interesting and fascinating data models um, that can scale and be used in interesting ways. That's why you know, thinking about going through the site UI and building content types integrates so well with views and scales uh, significantly easier and has more versatility as opposed to um, something like WordPress where it's all more or less everything lives in like a single table, you're not getting a lot of columns, indexing isn't there. Um, so that's some stuff it does really well, and I think that really leads itself to um, allowing us to build experiences for content editors to enter as much uh, content and kind of curate and create a content-rich experience, um, which is wonderful for getting the data in and having people edit it and update the content. But the other side of that equation from a UX perspective is allowing that content to be discoverable some of that's through UX and design and our menu structures and like IA and navigating through the site. Primarily, especially on most of the projects I've worked on, the like main point of uh, discoverability for the content is always going to be search. Um, unless the user sees exactly what in their mind they're looking for that's contextually important to them as a big bold link where they happen to be looking on the page, a lot of times they're going to eventually filter to search. Um, where it's really important that we try to deliver contextually important documents. We don't limit um, limit like search inputs to kind of dead results. Um, mostly because I think this was just um, something that I had in front of me and it was kind of easy uh, to help articulate. Like, I think we're all familiar with search. Um, you know, we can think of something like Google's homepage or Amazon within Drupal, and you get this out of the box on a new install. You'll get a search page that is um, powered by the database. You get a little search input, and if you have content, you can find that content. It's great. I can enter a term. I can get results. Um, but again, talking about understanding the tools that are available to us, it's all about understanding the trade-offs that we're um, OK with, what's acceptable, and what fits our business needs. So Drupal out of the box comes with database searching, which again, pretty cool. Um, to remove Drupal's UI out of the equation, looking kind of under the hood with um, what we're talking about. Can you hit the lights over there, maybe? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's better for me. I don't know if it's better for y'all. Um, looking under the hood, you know, if let's assume that there is a search inbox on the Florida Drupal Camp uh, session list, rather than just the, the filters at the top. Um, if I want to search all of the sessions for a specific title, you know, Mike just gave a talk this morning about Composer plugins. Um, this would be kind of how I would do it if I wanted to see the result that I uh, am looking for. If I'm looking for his talk, I know the title of the talk, I can search by title. Um, SQL query, pretty straightforward. I'm going to do a where clause, look for the title field, title matches the text I've entered, I get the results, huzzah. Um, that's kind of a 
fictitious best case scenario that I don't think is ever going to actually be applicable. Uh, there's a lot of things that this kind of search can't do. Like we can we can try to scale it up a little bit, but you know. That example assumed I knew exactly what the title was. Um, I didn't fat finger any of my keys. I knew how to spell the words and um, the conjugation, the plurality. I've used all of the exact um, words and the exact written the way they're written for the title. You know, other permutations of like maybe I've been jumping between things. I can't remember what small components within Composer are. Are they plugins? Are they libraries? Are they modules? I don't know. Maybe I look for composer modules. Um, maybe um, I, I'm thinking of composer plugin because I'm looking for the singular version, so I type composer plugin instead of plugins. Um, or maybe I just like I fat finger um, the word and I, I just outright misspell something. Um, the sad thing is, I'll get zero results for any of those because there's nothing that exactly matches that. Um, kind of, kind of a basic example, but we can we can scale database search and MySQL queries to be a little bit more robust than just this. Um, enter substring matching, um, doing like some, trying to build our own like fuzzy match system. So maybe on the back end, I take the user input that they search and um, I, you know, I, I'm even trying to be a little bit clever. I'm going, we're going to break all the words up by spaces. Uh, I don't care about numbers because it's a weird thing to add into a substring matching. So if there's numbers in a search string, ignore it split everything by white space and we'll do substring matching. So this is maybe how I could scale that out of going to look um, individually on each row or each node in the database and try to match on each of the words that we split up in the title. Good news is uh, Mike's talk would return. I get the result I'm looking for. Um, if we're thinking about this from a content discoverability perspective though, this is only going to serve up really the example, again, I know exactly what I'm looking for and limit a lot of things that are actually contextually similar that I would have interest if I was really look, wanting to look more at Composer plugins. Um, you know, I uh, wouldn't get a different title entirely about like writing Composer plugins um, or just one that doesn't have the word plugins at all. There's a lot of things that are excluded that as a user trying to learn more with this state of data would be relevant to me. So we can extend this a little bit more. Um, instead of having to match both of those terms exactly using substring matching, we could swap the and for the or. Pretty cool, we have a lot more flexibility there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see a lot more results. I'm, I'm getting the Composer plugins. Um, uh, plurality doesn't matter. I could have Composer plugin, rising, um, composing plugins. Um, you know, getting a lot more things relevant. Uh, something I wouldn't get is there's no textual processing um, from a natural language perspective. Maybe I'm way off on that field and I, like I come, I'm coming from Node and I know what NPM is and I'm, I'm looking for the package manager. I just, I can't for the life of me remember that it's Composer. Um, I wouldn't get anything like that that doesn't have the exact words that I'm looking for in it. So like we're, we're getting better, but you know there's still limitations, and I think there's things to um, to recognize there. So we, we could implement this. Um, the the issue with this last solution, which kind of gave us the closest permutation of what we were looking for, is it's really not going to be a solution that scales well. Like these are okay. What's happening here is at a database level, we're having to go through on every single row for every single word that we're trying to match here for the OR condition. And we're scanning every row multiple times. So if I end up splitting that up into, uh, I've got five different terms I'm trying to match on because someone entered like a, a long sentence fragment or something like that. Or like maybe it's how to write composer plugins for Drupal. I'm searching for five terms. If I have millions of database records, I've just kind of created this giant bottleneck where I'm scanning a single table five different times entirely top to bottom. Um, so like, it, it's there and we can make it work and I think this is a lot of what, what um, at smaller scale Drupal does well. I know that um, WordPress does a lot of really clever things including weights and stuff, but it, it, understanding there's limits to this and also like we're missing some contextual knowledge that um, I, would have been important to me. There was a talk on you know, dependency management would never come up in this kind of uh, implementation of search. Um, so, just recognizing 
database queries are awesome out of the box for searching, but there are some limitations. Um, you know, I want to say you really are only limited to substring matching. That's not strictly too true. You can do clever things with like weightings and uh, sound X functions and just weird subquery processing. I've never seen that work successfully, but like technically there's other things. Practically, substring matching is what you have in MySQL. Um, there's also some limitations. Of, like, it, it can't handle spelling matches. Like It's really going to look for um, just the exact match within a substring. You know, I could add some more, like try to do more wild cards, but we're getting performance issues again. Um, also, it doesn't understand like linguistics at all. If I want to do that, that's a lot of like if conditionals, or I have to do a lot of that work and heavy lifting myself. It wouldn't understand the difference between the word developing and develop, despite those really at its root being the same word. Um, additionally, wouldn't understand synonyms at all. If I'm looking for developing, but there's something, there's a result with coding in it. Again, MySQL has no uh, concept of this out of the box. There's nothing really native. This would entirely be on me to implement these kind of libraries. And with a lot of like dictionary linguistic lookups and like another abstraction layer from that, that's a lot. Rather than going through to build all of that within MySQL, um, oh, and then, you know, also, it also is going to match unimportant words unless I explicitly build, again, another abstraction layer to start filtering those out. Articles aren't important, linking verbs, prepositions, probably not as contextually important to the words I'm looking for and the results. Um, so there, you know, there's some limitations there. Also, and I didn't really touch on this, is it's trying its best to cut off the bottom of this resolution. Um, you know, the matches we get back are going to be matches. Out of the box, unless I've done something like added my own manually created weighting field to this, um, my results aren't sorted by relevancy. They're just sorted by you know, what's matched, and I can sort on field, I can sort alphabetically, or by some other value that's available in the database schema, but uh, that's not always usually relevant to users. They're wanting to see the things that are most relevant to what they're looking for towards the top of the list. Um, we, we talked about this, of course, like, it, scalability is going to be a concern as you're scanning the database um, as much for as more as you're adding more search words. Um, so, you know, kind of recognizing, again, and I think database is awesome for building um, search in some, in some instances, but we've seen some limitations. I've kind of run into some bottlenecks of needing some advanced functionality or needing it to scale to a much higher level. I think there's a better tool for that, especially within the Drupal ecosystem, and that's Solar, which I want to kind of talk a little bit about. And before we look at, like, there's a lot of dependencies, there's a bit of a call stack there. I um, want to look at like, what advantages we're getting with going this route of introducing this entirely new technology. And one, Solar as a search is kind of built from the ground up to be text centric, which means it's, you know, you're going to get a lot of things like text processing, natural language processing, anything where us as humans is interpreting text and text-based information, um, Solar's kind of have a lot of things built in um, around it because that, that's what it's designed to do, much as Drupal is designed to be an excellent content management system and a framework to build on top of that. Secondly, uh, from an infrastructure perspective, Solar is designed to be read-first, which is kind of neat, has a different indexing schema to what MySQL does, Additionally, their caching layers are designed and assuming that it's meant to be read first. Effectively, what that means to us in practice is it's very good at um, returning data back blazingly fast, um, not the best at writing and reading data um, blazingly fast speed. So like, it's an important distinction. I don't know that I've run into this too much within Drupal, but like, it wouldn't be a great option for something like day trading where you just have a hose of information coming in you need real-time data also coming out. Not a great instance for that. It's more like it needs to have its indexes, build the caches up around that so it can return responses um, in a timely fashion. Um, second, it's document-oriented, which is different than MySQL, which is kind of rigid and, and, and its schema. We have to define um, new columns, what the tables are. We can't deviate too much from that and don't have a lot of flexibility. That's good, and that usually is because uh, you know we want to build robust indexes around our database, but uh, you know, Solar's backend is a NoSQL document storage, which, and I'll go through in a little bit, gives us a lot of flexibility with the kind of data we throw to it and what kind of functionality we can get out. Uh, and secondly, you know, we're, it's designed for large data volumes, which kind of 
also bleeds, uh, or blends in with the read first. Um, flexible schema, again, we talked about that. Um, so just quickly to look at document storage. Um, you know, everything within Solar is like, it, it's a key value pair, more or less, um, which is great, works well for us um, within the Drupal community where a lot of our content types and entities are fields and field values. Um, that translates very well, which is one of the reasons Solar works so great out of the box with Search API. We can kind of abstract our database layer and it translates fairly well into a um, Solar document. Um, you know, some example like document formats that works well with Solar or just interacting with these kind of APIs, JSON, XML, um, PDFs, which I, I don't use a lot, but that's also an option. Um, usually, um, at least out of the box, nodes are going to be expressed as a single document within Solar. Um, you can think of that, we'll, we'll use the JSON notation, I think that's easiest with, um, you know, everyone's familiar with like, the REST API and kind of what works, with, with, works well within Drupal. Um, this is, uh, you know, some of my examples are housing related because, you know, been trying to uh, foolishly end up with a house over the last two years. Thought that, that was a good time in my life to start that endeavor. Um, but, you know, if I had a, a website where, a, a Drupal site where, you know, I had nodes, something like Zillow or Redfin, and, you know, a lot of houses were my nodes and my content types, this would be kind of a representation of what a listing could look like. And see, I, I've got a unique ID, which maybe necessarily isn't the exact node ID. Um, I would have like a location field, it's a text field, um, the number of bedrooms, that would be like an integer number field within Drupal, and then a type, which could be like a list or taxonomy term where I'm pushing the title. But this is pretty straightforward. Um, what's unique about like, a document storage solution um, and what we can do with Solar on the back end is, again, it's, I was talking about that flexibility. We don't necessarily have to predefine what the schema is of, of a specific document type. We have the flexibility. We can arbitrarily, arbitrarily add new fields without having to define the schema or like, a lot of information about them. To expand on a previous example, maybe our website's grown, and obviously on, from the Drupal perspective, we have to add fields. The field UI adds database columns, that sort of thing. Uh, but as far as Solar is concerned, we can just start throwing new fields into new nodes that get listed. We can switch and decide we want to expand our houses to include houses for sale, houses for rents. Both of those have different information attached to them. You know, if it's for sale, MLS number is probably going to be relevant. If it's for rent, people don't really care about the MLS number so much, but they really, really want to know upfront what what's the rent price range you're looking at. Um, so we we very easily can support this, and as far as Solar is concerned, like we are able to um, build searches off of those fairly easily without having to do a lot of um, additional definitions. Um, really regretting that choice of transitioning between dark and light slides now that the lights are off. Um, to, to look at a very high level of what the call stack looks like, um, you know, usually when we're within Drupal, you know, there's a search API and maybe we're just inter in interacting with um, the views, but to understand everything kind of going on. Solar is its entire different, a different technology. You know, it's written in Java, it's running within the JVM, it's got a Jetty server running somewhere, and that's how it's communicating over HTTP. Um, the important things, kind of somewhat important for us, is like you know, keep in mind uh, a Solar server can have a core. The core has the index. The index is what stores all our documents and builds um, kind of the index that allows us to get the performance at scales. The details aren't important. I kind of translate you know, in a Drupal mind, like cores are more or less like our database. Like if I wanted a new core, I could spin it up. It's similar if I wanted a second database within Drupal. Um, on the Drupal side of the ecosystem, um, you know, if you want to use Solar within Drupal, there's the Search API Solar module, which itself is an implementation of the Search API module, which was an attempt to try to unify and create general interfaces for all of the search solutions within Drupal, Solar, Elasticsearch. There's a search API database implementation, which is kind of clever. Um, but if, if you're using um, Solar, there's another dependency for a uh, PHP library called Solarium, which is really wonderful. I and mean, if you're ever curious of under the hood how Solar is working, that's a great place. Their documentation is actually really fantastic. Um, and 
uh, there's been a few times, if, if there's a newer feature or something that you're looking for, sometimes you can get that from the Solarium documentation. Maybe Search API doesn't have an implementation of that yet. That library is loaded, you have fully access to that. It's auto-loaded. Um, that's available to you if it suits your needs. Um, but, you know, Drupal's also, just, Drupal's communicating back and forth to Solar over HTTP, you know, talking about the document types. Uh, you know, we could be doing that over uh, JSON, XML, really any of those available write types. Um, but JSON's the easiest thing, it's easiest to read and more familiar with people in the Drupal space. Um, oh, that's not big enough to see. <laughs> um, Want to kind of walk through what querying in Solar looks like to understand exactly what's happening under the hood. Um, obviously, all of this in, in, at the end of the day ends up getting implemented within Drupal. Let's see if I can zoom in a bit. Um, so what this is is this is um, you know, Solar comes with an admin UI that's available. Um, a lot of times, if you're relying on a hosted Solar solution through like a hosting partner, this isn't always exposed, um, but if you're working on it locally, in this case, it is exposed. It's a great tool for kind of debugging and, and going through and seeing what's going on. Um, if I were to load it from scratch, I can see kind of more system admin level, level things, but what I'm really looking at is I'm looking for the core, you know, our database. Within that core, I can find all kinds of things like how many documents I have indexed, that sort of thing. Um, additionally, there's a query tool kind of like a, I don't know, GUI Postman asks for building post request. Um, it's kind of an interesting debugging tool. Wanted to walk through kind of what some of the generic parameters are um, within um, writing solar queries. So if I hit execute, this is, I, I haven't filtered anything. I'm using this kind of wildcard selector on our query field. Um, query field is what the user, it's the query string, that's what the key parameter is short for. Um, these are what our, this is what our user input goes to, um, and this shorthand, the star colon star, is just a wild card. I'm searching all values for across all fields. Uh, the format for the query field is a key value search, so I could search for a specific value on a specific field, or I can kind of determine like a defined field of any time there's a query search, I want you to search um, this field. If you think of Google's homepage where there's that single search input box um, or you know, Amazon's the same, this is what that search inbox translates to. And this field's kind of important. You know, this is where a lot of query, like the processing and textual processing and uh, text analysis will be performed. Uh, so to see what that looks like, uh, I'm going to just quickly set my default field and search for the term Lego. Oh, use the wrong field too. And they say live demos are hard. <laughs> this is my title field. Fills up and let go. Cool. Um, so I gave a I gave a string input, got a result set of documents back. Um, we can see these are JSON, and uh, to give a more visual indication of what that is, um, this is uh, you know just some placeholder data. I wanted a data set that I could play with. I was currently had Legos on the mind. Um, you know maybe shopping for houses, I was a little bit depressed, so shopping for Legos to kind of keep my mind off of it. Uh, so, you know, this is the Drupal site and what's powering that search index that we're kind of walking through as an example. That query field um, is identical to the search input field here, which again, akin to the homepage of Drupal or the homepage of Google where you have that, that user input field. Um, I can search Lego, and I, you can see I'm getting results back and looking at, you know, let's look at the Wonder Woman minifigure here. As far as fields, I've got a title, I've got an image. Um, looks like it's a taxonomy term of what set that it belongs to and that it's currently in stock. Um, if I were to look here, I can see here's the document representation within Solar as a JSON object that represents that exact node. 
Um, there are some things here that aren't that important, but like, you know, I have an ID field that directly um, correlates to that node ID within Drupal, also handles translations if that's important. Um, the search API implementation for Drupal and search will support translations, which is great for multilingual sites. Um, but going through, you know, here's my title, um, here's the the same set that it belongs to, I can see that it's in stock. Um, so you know, those are all my fields, kind of neat. Um, I, it's important to, I think, start understanding kind of what the tools under the hoods that are available to us um, beyond just throwing up a, a views page and saying it's solar. Uh, so we walked through the Q parameter field. Um, you know, again, the syntax is a uh, key value. The, the key is the field name that trans, um, loosely translates to what um, the field name is within Drupal. Search API with Drupal tends to prefix fields to be more clear with what they are within Drupal. Um, which is what these, um, you know, BS, ITM, SS, um, SS is like a short string, BS is a Boolean string. Um, that's more just giving an indication of what the field type is in Drupal. That's a, a bit of a compromise between Drupal or Drupal. PHP being, I want to say a loosely typed language, but it's more like Schrodinger's type, of like everything's every type and no type at the same time. Um, so there's Java, Java strictly typed. Um, so that's kind of a compromise to help get through that. Um, next up, FQ, and this is the other main um, component to interact with Solar. The FQ stands for filter queries. Um, they are a check for inclusion or exclusion. Because of that, they're going to just be blazingly fast. Um, importantly, and this is a big one, uh, FQ is just, a, because it's a check on inclusion or exclusion, they're going to have no effect whatsoever on relevancy. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm searching for Legos uh, and I want to maybe filter by things that are in stock, it's not going to alter um, the relevancy of the most relevant Lego searches showing up at the top. And maybe um, you know, there's a connect set also listed here that's going to be at the bottom because it's not at all um, related. Additionally, um, you know, because it's that inclusion exclusion check. They're extremely fast to compute as well. Um, they also same, follow the same value, the same syntax as the queue parameter um, in that it's you know, field name, uh, value, key pair. To walk through what that looks like, let's uh, take our same exact example where we're, you know, we're at eight sets right now. Uh, we're at eight, eight documents to return that it's giving back to me. I want to uh, I want to filter this set down just a smidge more, um, and I want to exclude every. Actually, I want to include things that have their stock listed as true, which is great. Uh, but you can see my return results went from eight to seven. Uh, again, to give you kind of the Drupal visualization of how this could work, um, let's hit. Apply. Uh, ignore that it's not a themed result set. Um, but what I've said here, let's do the same exact search term. What I'm saying here is, you know, my Q parameter is Lego. I'm searching all title fields for Lego. Um, and this, you know, to emphasize the point I made earlier about, you know, us being us having a little more flexibility with Solar, um, it's actually going ahead and trying to find the base of the word. So plural, um, it's going to try to stem it, so if I'm using a different conjugation, it will. So, um, um, Q parameter is still the same as far as solar is concerned from a tokenized perspective. It's looking at the Q term Lego. Um, and here I've got my FQ parameter where I'm just doing an inclusion check for true. If I wanted to go the opposite route and only include results where they're out of stock, I don't know why, maybe I'm looking for what the popular results are, I can also do that. Um, so, you know, I think this is um, kind of important. Like, this is the raw data that, um, one, that Search API is sending. It's sending this, this request, which you can see um, we're constructing up here. It's sending this request based on the parameters that we've entered into the search field. It's sending this to Solar. Solar's giving it back this um, JSON response, and then it's ultimately up to the client side, in this case Drupal, to implement and build this in a way that's usable for the end user. The great thing is a lot of this, uh, 
if your needs fit within kind of what comes out of the box, a lot of this is easily to um, get access to through views and the facet API, or, sorry, the facets module that was renamed in nine. Uh, you get a lot of this out of the box, and even if you want to extend it, a lot of the core APIs that those technologies are using to kind of drive these pages are available to you. Um, to quickly touch on sort, you know, if we the default sort method within Solar is going to be by relevancy, so if you don't explicitly define it, you're getting relevant results back first. That's most often what we see, but sometimes you want to sort, uh, sometimes we get clients asking to sort content alphanumerically, which is fine. Um, you have the ability to sort on any field value, uh, which I'm not going to do seeing we're, we're climbing up on time. But you, you can sort on that. I think that's more useful if you wanted to like sort by price, put things um, from lowest to highest um, uh, price-wise, or I don't know, maybe it's a directory of people and you wanted to sort uh, alphanumerically. But again, if you exclude this, you can explicitly define relevancy, or if you exclude it, it defaults to re relevancy. Um, next up is the FL parameter. Um, this is important if you're looking at scale. Looking at the kind of examples we're getting back, um, you know, I'm just getting back an entire document representation of everything that Solar has in that entire document that matches what I'm searching for. Um, if I was doing a very high volume of traffic and looking to reduce uh, payload size uh, of the actual request, maybe my documents, instead of only being, you know, having 10 fields, maybe they have just hundreds of fields and the requests I'm getting back are just megabytes in size and I'm looking to truncate that. That's where the FL parameter can come in handy. Uh, it's a CSV list of field values that you can explicitly say, I don't want everything based on what I'm going to display to the user and what I need to support my filters. Only give me the fields that are important to me. It's a great way to be semantically relevant in your response, but also limit the payload size. Um, there is one, there's a couple of fields that are actually included in your documents that are hidden by default. And if, if you're ever debugging when you have a solar search result and you want more information, you can even you know, expose this um, through uh, the search API field list, um, but this is kind of what's going on under the, under the, the hood. There's, an un, there's a hidden score field. So if I wanted to, I'm going to keep the same search where we're looking for Legos that are in stock. Um, I'm going to use the wildcard to say, give me all the fields in the document, but also include the hidden score field if I wanted to see what the relevancy score in a float value was, which is super useful. Um, additionally, if I, and this is again, useful when debugging relevant relevancy in search queries. If I wanted both the relevancy score and I also wanted a breakdown of how Solar is trying to calculate those relevancies, I can attack on the explain field. Um, again, very useful when you've got a lot of field, you've got a lot of weights going on and complicated searches. Um, this purely from a um, Solar perspective will kind of go through what it's doing to process, how it's tokenizing it, what query process we're going, it's going through, um, but extremely useful when maybe you have a search and the entire team feels something is more relevant, but Solar is convinced it's not, um, useful in debugging those. Not gonna go through all of the input, but uh, a useful tool to have in your belt for sure. Um, DF, which we covered a little bit in the beginning. Um, it's just a defined field. It's kind of the default um, the default search field where the queue parameters will go. We can either allow the, the user to specifically search for um, a given field um, and expose that to some kind of uh, sanitized input, or we can just let them search everything and give them a defined field that's most important. Typically, I see this as two things. It's either going to be the title field, um, where we're allowing them to search everything, or a lot of times what we do is we render the entire node out, like the HTML we would get from the render array, we store that on a field within the document, that way the entire page, as the end user would see it, is also in the search index, and we can use that and expose that to the end user. Um, Lastly, again, and we're sticking with JSON because it's easy. Also, it's very easy to work with JSON API within Drupal. Um, there's uh, you know, the, the writer type, the WT format. Uh, 
I've, only, I've never used this in PHP or Drupal, but it is kind of fascinating. Um, your standard formats you'd expect, like JSON and XML, um, you additionally could have it just spit out the directly um, the uh, language constructs for Ruby, Python, and PHP. Um, so if I, I don't know, wanted to, for some reason, didn't have access to a JSON API and like didn't want to deal with sanitizing or like converting that value out, not sure why, in Drupal at least, um, but I can just have it give me back a PHP array that I can just directly access in my response. All right. Um, so to high level review, um, you know, important to keep in mind, the two main kind of interactions with Solar, you have your FQ parameters where you know, we're trying to limit the matching dots. Again, don't have an effect on relevancy, their inclusion or exclusion checks. Second is the QString, which also is an attempt to try to limit the results that we're getting back, but it's also used to calcul calculate relevancy. I and mean, that's what we're gonna get our scores off of. So using those in conjunction, FQ is really good for filtering data sets into smaller sets. Because we're doing that, and that does involve exact matching, typically that is not taking user input to help filter things. Um, that's relying more on things like taxonomy term labels that are going to be consistent across, or Boolean fields, or numerical values. We can, but I think from a UX perspective, that makes a lot more sense as like a checkbox or a drop down or something along those lines. Um, the actual, like from a, trying to build a reasonable search experience for them, I mean, and of course they're very fast, um, that was a lot of the, they rewrote a lot of this, um, I think between Solar 3 or 4, I think it was Solar 6, um, so it's a lot faster, which is awesome. Um, but the idea is we want to filter things down as much as we can to prevent relevant data, but avoid situations where we're pushing users to kind of dead search pages where they get no results back. Um, it's a great way just to have them bounce off the site. Um, additionally important, the um, FQ parameters don't run through a lot of the query parsers, so we're not doing a lot of like tokenization or, or stimming or trying to do that, that sub-processing to find out like what conjugation they really meant. Is plural important? I'm sorry, again, that's usually best served by different UI elements, like a drop-down, a checkbox, something where uh, we're giving a limited subset of what those possible values can be to the users. Um, this plays really well with faceted search. Um, you know, we've all uh, presumably all been on Amazon at some point and seen how we get the like break, the results breaking down. Of you know, we have the option to filter these query, uh, filter these results down to smaller subsets, um, but it lets us kind of gives us an indication that there's a large or some given number of documents in a smaller group that allows us to kind of hone in our searches even further to find what we're looking for. Um, additionally important, what most of us don't ever see is when we're doing that kind of clustering of, of search results, it also just kind of facets typically just are excluded when there's no results. Again, the name of the game is always avoiding dead search results. Um, but it's a great way to give user feedback of, you know, Continuing down this train of thought, continuing to like drill into this set of data. Um, you know, there's there's search results for you. you know, maybe there's one, maybe there's thirty, and that's useful information with allowing our content to be discoverable. Um, and I can, but again, Lego's still on the mind. Housing market's kind of garbage, so still trying to bring the happy back in my life. But this is kind of a, a visual example of what that would look like within a to run through the. We're talking about breaking our search results up into groups. And it's important to recognize there's a couple of faceted types. Like I, I think we, we can visualize that. There's a checkbox or there's a link on the side, has you know, a number of how many documents or search results we'll get back for whatever that is. Um, easiest one, and I think the most straightforward, is field faceting. That's, hey, you know, there's, uh, you have 20 Lego minifigures of them. You know, five are tagged as DC heroes, three are tagged as Disney sets, um, and that, that's just us taking the value of those fields and those documents and getting a result back of how many we have um, that match that field value. Uh, another common use that you'll see um, with robust search uh, solutions is ranged faceting. I um, mean, that's, you know, if you have a numeric value specifically, 
you can specify a facet to break up your data set into groups based on the value between X and Y. That's great for like, setting price ranges, like facets for price ranges. So if you include a numeric value within your search document for price, you can then break up, um, specify the facets instead of having a thousand facets for every price variation, have three facets and break them up by ranges like a low, medium, and high cost basis. Um, and lastly, which we're, we're going to gloss over, but again, it's important to recognize that you have, when those aren't enough to give you the kind of facets you're looking for, additionally, you can use query faceting, which is, I, I, you know, it's not directly queryable within the search documents I have. You can supply a facet based on a different solar query if you have a really specific use case. Um, just excited to know that you're not limited by just field or just range. Um, testing demos. So go back to my little data set where I've got um, some Lego figures. Um, again, you know, looking at one of my content types, you can already see them on the sidebar there. Um, looking at my content types, I've got you know, many figures. The many figures have a title, image. Um, they also have this set field, which is just um, like our entity reference field to group them together. Everything requires a set, and then they have uh, a field just to specify whether they're in stock or out of stock. We kind of saw that a little bit in the search documents. Um, you know, Drupal, again, provides a lot of this out of the box. If I wanted to, let's replicate the search that I was building out of, um, building the, ser the search I was building out of the, the solar UI. Um, this is great. I'm searching for Legos and I can see, okay, there's seven more in stock. Uh, uh, there's only one in Disney. That's fine. Maybe I'm looking for gifts for, um, you know, my sister has two kids. Uh, the Disney's not going to work. They're never happy when they get the same exact thing. So I'm going to drill down into the um, DC Comics, which is great. Um, and I can see I've, I've gotten updated results from my other facets as well. But within this subset of data, there's additional subsets that I can explore and help further refine um, the data set down to something that I'm looking for that's more specific to me. Like, okay, cool, perfect, I can work with this. Um, from the back end, how that looks, or from like a, a solar perspective, I'm gonna get rid of my filter query here. Hit refresh. Um, uh, so that kind of facet that we're looking at from the UI perspective was pretty clearly a field-based facet. Um, so here I'm going to tell Solar I want my data faceted as it comes back, um, and I want to facet off of the set title, which is just a great way to, um, you know, do, whoop, maybe, there we go. Um, it's a great way to say I want my content back, but I need to explain to my user um, of this search result, how are things grouped, how can they go further. Um, Solar still gives me the same search results back, but I'm telling it I need additional information to present to my users. If I scroll to the end of all my search results, uh, I, I have a, another set of information I'm getting back from Solar, and that's just, hey, you, you asked for facets, here's further information about how the grouping is. Um, I think this is kind of interesting. Um, Solar's not the one... Solar's not directly giving you a callback or a path or setting the parameters. It's just telling you what the information is you want. It's entirely up to us on the client side to implement this as like a link or something where the user could interact with it. Fortunately, within Drupal, yeah, you know, the facet module is wonderful, and I think you can get this out of the box. Again, it's that sweet spot in Drupal of you get some options out of the box, which the you know the little demo here I have is just the Facet API module out of the box. Um, additionally, that comes with uh, the API code if you needed your own implementations where you needed to do some additional processing or wanted to maybe leverage something like a, um, a query Facet range. Um, so yeah, to, to kind of recap there, you know, it's, it's up to Drupal's front end layer for us to implement and do something for that. Um, I, the interesting thing with facets is like, if we're, especially if we're sticking with field-based facets, all those are are FQ parameters, and that's what the interaction level is. Solar's telling us how we can group our data by field most, most commonly, 
And if we can go by that, we can easily translate as a one-to-one -one translation, kind of an easy way to implement that client side to then create that as a FQ, um, FQ parameter to limit the data set, don't change my relevancy at all. So in my Drupal site, when I'm clicking one of these, it's a facet, it's telling me how much data I have grouped there. What's happening when I interact with it is I'm then filtering using the FQ parameter to filter my data set down smaller. Uh, we'll gloss over this because we're almost at time. We'll just blaze through the last. Um, this is just kind of emphasizing of like, I, I, I think the, the Solarium API, which is what this says, is again, pretty intuitive. It follows several like PSR standards. It doesn't have dependencies in any other framework like Symfony, so it's easy, it's lightweight to add, but it feels familiar, <clears throat> especially to us that have worked with Symfony components in Drupal before. Um, we'll just fly through this just to be aware. You know, I was talking about like some textual processing, especially um, from a query perspective. You know, a few things, not all of them. You, you have access to stop word filters, the things that just aren't important. Important. Uh, you know, pull out articles, prepositions, linking verbs. This is uh, you can you can rely on kind of contributed shared dictionary lists for this. You can update this and add your own for maybe things that aren't important to your specific use cases. Um, there's stem filters, which is great. There's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, one of the things is it basically takes a word, tries to break it down and find the root word that you're searching for. This is what will handle plural, like plurality. Um, and you know, if I search pl different um, like singularity or plural of a word, it's gonna break it down to a core word. Um, it can also handle co conjugations as well. If I'm using, you know, again, go back to the example, if I'm using like coding um, and I'm looking for code or yeah, swim, like all the conjugations of swimming, um, It'll break that down and like find the root word, um, which is great because it'll when it's looking through documents, it'll do the same thing. If I type swimming, it's going to break it down to the, the root word of swim, which then, as it's looking for documents, will match swim, swam, swum, swimming, um, match all of those. And I think that I mean that's the relevancy we're looking for. It will affect the relevancy score, but I'll still get those results back. Is is important to me. Um, can break words up, which is kind of an interesting thing, especially when figuring out how you know, hyphens are gonna work with you. That's a delimiter graph filter, that's available. Um, it just basically is how you're gonna break words up. Are hyphens important to you, are they not? That's also configurable. Um, there's a whole slew of these. Um, the solar documentation I think is, great, is, is a lot better than Drupal's search API documentation as far as what they do, what their intent is. A lot of these are already available in Drupal um, if you use the search API and look at uh, your index, a lot of these directly correlate to the processor tabs. They're not, the naming is not one for one identical, which is kind of frustrating, which is again why I think the solar documentation is a better, clearer example as to what their intent is, how to leverage them, how to deal with things like conjugation across multiple languages. Um, but a lot of times the, the bedrock to implement those within Drupal is already there. Um, okay, only three minutes over, just like uh, all my calls at work. But that's the end. I think there's some important uh, links there. At the very beginning of the talk, before I started, um, you saw me, all my um, slides are in Git. I'll push those up to GitHub. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I always post a, a link to those. Um, those will live on the web if they're useful for you at all or not, or want to use them as reference, or just want to ping me with questions about solar or what the next Lego set I should add to my collection is. With that, any questions, comments, or concerns? Or is everybody ready to get lunch and head home? <laughs> We'll hit stop and...